Okay, I should have said the 5G chairman because I really think we have a lot to uh, thank, thank you for. Um, we heard earlier today from Larry Kudlow, who you know we were going to try and do a, a fireside chat with. Yeah. He did great. Um, he made sure that we knew about the White House's commitment to the United States leading the 5G race. Um, you are working very closely with him, yeah. which is tremendous for all of us. Um, but the same question to you, why is it so important that we win the 5G race? Oh, well, first off, Meredith, thank you. Thanks to CTIA for uh, inviting me here. Thanks for all of you uh, taking an interest in this you important conversation. I, yeah, they're not here for me, I can assure <laughs> you that. But, uh, uh, but uh, I have to salute uh, Director Kudlow as well and his entire team at the White House National Economic Council. They have been strong champions of our efforts on 5G, and I think they're helping to deliver on this administration's commitment to U.S. leadership in this next generation of wireless connectivity. Uh, the same goes with our colleagues at the State Department and Department of Defense and NASA and elsewhere. It's been a, a really strong effort, I think, across these agencies. Uh, from our perspective, at least, we think that 5G leadership is important for, for a variety of different reasons. The macro reason, of course, is we want the United States to be the haven for innovation and investment. Uh, we saw what happened with 4G LTE, where we created these next generation networks, but on top of that, an entire mobile economy arose that no one could have predicted when the iPhone debuted back in 2007. And we suspect 5G, if anything, is going to be even more transparent Formative. It's a completely different technology, 100 times faster speeds, much lower latency, tremendous amount of throughput and capacity in these new networks. And that allows for all these verticals from medicine to agriculture to online education, uh, you name it, to really thrive. And so we want to make sure that the U.S. is leading uh, from a macro level, just a national competitiveness in an increasingly competitive global environment. But the second reason is that we truly believe that 5G could empower consumers in ways that are unthinkable right now. I mean, if you look into the future, it's not inconceivable that 5G could be used for uh, advanced telemedicine, uh, you're doing robotic surgery and the like. And so uh, we really want American consumers to be on the leading edge in terms of the benefits that this new digital revolution is going to bring. And uh, as we know, capital and talent are fickle, and they're going to go to a place where they suspect that the, the capital and talent can find a, the best home. We want America to be that home. Very well said. I couldn't agree more. All right. Absolutely. This is about the industries of the future, and we want Uber for connected health to be American. Yeah. So um, with that goal in mind, you laid out last year your vision for the 5G FAST plan, and it's remarkable, really remarkable, how much of your plan you've gotten done federal siting reform, local siting reform, and now two high band auctions. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> well, how do you assess this great product? Uh, to be clear, the credit does not go to me. It goes to the FCC's fantastic staff that has done tremendous work setting up these auctions, very complicated to set up. And uh, to all of those who have particip participated in as well, they've made it a success. So uh, I am only the person who gets the credit, but honestly, the credit should be uh, given to the f folks who aren't on the front pages, who really do the legwork each and every day on behalf of the public interest. Um, yeah, it's just been tremendous. In terms of the 5G Fast plan itself, though, we feel really positive about where we are. It was uh, uncertain when we rolled it out last year. How much could we actually execute on this ambitious plan? Uh, we rolled it out in the context of the 5G Summit at the White House, where Director Kudlow gave us a good vision of what he wanted to see in the future. And we've been executing. Uh, the plan includes, for those of you who haven't studied it in detail or Googled it in the last couple of minutes, uh, promoting much more spectrum into the commercial marketplace, uh, promoting wireless infrastructure, the small cells and other infrastructure that will make up these next generation networks, then modernizing our regulations to promote more fiber deployment. Deployment. And on the spectrum front alone, I mean, I think we've been extremely aggressive by anyone's expectations. As you mentioned, we successfully completed the 28 gigahertz auction in the middle of a 24 gigahertz auction that has already yielded almost $2 billion in gross bids. Uh, we'll be auctioning off later this year in a single group, uh, the upper 37, 39, 47 gigahertz bands. And so by the time these auctions are done, we will have allocated over five gigahertz of spectrum for mobile broadband for 5G. And to put that in perspective, that's more spectrum than is currently held by every mobile broadband provider in the United States today combined. So that's the, all right, you're the one, all right, very nice to know, all right. I hope you're bidding, by the way, so. Um, 
But uh, so we're really excited about what that means. And going into the future, it's not just those millimeter wave bands. We're also looking elsewhere in the spectrum. 3.5 gigahertz, we looked to hope to auction in 2020. Also looking at auctions in the 2.5 gigahertz band, as well as uh, repurposing the 3.7 gigahertz band. And all of that is just on the license side. In addition, in terms of wireless, uh, or unlicensed rather, we've been extremely aggressive. You proposed 1,200 megahertz in the 6 gigahertz band to really supercharge Wi-Fi. We allocated recently 21 gigahertz in the bands above 90 5 gigahertz, so the uh, supply of spectrum is not going to be a problem when it comes to the 5G future, we're con confident. And the infrastructure side as well, as you pointed out, we've been really aggressive, making sure that you can have the physical building blocks of these networks that will look very different from the 4G networks we know today. Uh, well, you, you've done a great job. We're really grateful. Um, on behalf of the whole industry, thank you again. Um, but I'm also glad that you touched on some of the work that's still to be done. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, because the race is far from over, and yeah. we really have to be ready for a counterpunch from our global rivals, I think. Um, so let's drill down a little bit on Spectrum. So yeah. You touched on it, but um, thanks to your efforts, obviously we are now first globally in low band and high band. Yeah. But, you know, mid band still eludes us. Right. So how do, I guess, how do we move forward? And can you talk a little bit more about your approach to freeing mid band for 5G this year? Sure. So we have been actively working on the 2.5 gigahertz band, uh, traditionally known as the EBS band for short, and uh, been taking meetings with stakeholders left and right to try to figure out how can we best repurpose this public resource to promote the technologies of the future. And uh, we hope to be able to move on that at some point uh, uh, in the future. And uh, I think it's important because right now that asset, as we see it at least, has not been used to its highest valued extent. And that's an area where the United States uh, has spoken, I think, on a pretty much a bipartisan basis. The FCC vote on this issue was bipartisan in itself. In addition, you pointed out the 3.5 gigahertz band. I delegated to Commissioner O'Reilly uh, two years ago, I think it was, um, the task of trying to repurpose some of the rules in order to make sure that we made 3.5 very useful for 5G. And that CBRS framework I think we've established will serve us well into the future. Uh, now we're working with the NTIA and others to do some of the last remaining steps in order to auction off uh, that band as well. Uh, 3.7, as you might have heard, is uh, you know, one of the issues we've been tackling as well. Uh, one of the more complex bands we've had to encounter, uh, a lot of different interests, different proposals for how to accommodate those interests, and uh, constantly sitting down with the engineers and the economists and the lawyers and everybody else at the commission and outside the commission uh, to try to figure out what the best solution is. But the bottom line is, in terms of mid-band, we do have some work to do, but that work is being done, and we hope to be able to deliver some results in the near future. It's clearly a big priority for our industry, and that's great to hear. Um, we need to come together to get mid-band done right and done fast. Yeah. Um, I think I'd love to celebrate some big wins when we're together at our show in October. <laughs> it's not saying no, guys. It's not saying no. Um, I'll tweet it out. You'll find out then. <laughs> uh, yeah. All right. So speaking of collaboration, we heard today some really exciting initial deployments. Um, yeah. From a Parsons, Kansas perspective, how can we work together to push 5G to more and more communities across the country. Yeah, this is an issue that's really important to me. Uh, those of you who don't have the uh, blessing of being from Kansas, uh, Parsons is a very small town, three hours south of Kansas City, two hours from Wichita, two hours from Tulsa. It's pretty rural. And one of the issues that has consistently been raised is, well, look, that's all great uh, US leadership in 5G. We're all in favor of that on a macro level, but on a micro level, what will this mean for me in my rural community? And one of the things we want to make sure is that every American is able to benefit from the digital revolution. Uh, my first day in office, I said that closing that digital divide was important to me for rural Americans, for low-income urban Americans, people on tribal lands, et cetera. And that's part of the reason why we've been encouraging the development of this technology in a way that will, in fact, benefit everybody else. Uh, for example, just last week, I was visiting a startup in the Bay Area, and they're looking to use uh, very innovative solutions in the 60 gigahertz band, uh, you know, so super wide channels, uh, very high capacity throughput, to be able to provide an alternative uh, to uh, for, for parts of the country where there simply is never going to be a business case for laying fiber. And whether it is essentially wireless backhaul or uh, rural fiber fixed wireless uh, applications, they're really bullish about what 5G might mean uh, in terms of rural America. Uh, same thing with Ted Rappaport, who's a professor at NYU, who I had the pleasure of meeting a couple of years ago, he's served as a sort of, he's given us the intellectual foundation for developing the millimeter wave policies uh, that we've we've had. And I remember asking him when I met, had lunch with him a couple of years ago in New York City, well, 
this is all well and good, it sounds really great, but do you really think it's gonna have an application in rural America? And he sat up in his chair and said, absolutely, because he thinks that this is one of the ways of solving the classic problem of low population density, lower income, and all the rest, that this is a technological way of solving the problem that too many broadband providers have had to confront. And so we wanna make sure as we go forward, whether it's a 2.5 band, uh, where we proposed, as you might know, uh, giving tribal entities, for example, a window in which to use that technology to provide 5G services uh, to people on tribal lands, or the millimeter wave bands, uh, we keep the door open for rural America to be able to benefit from the great innovations that you and your members are delivering. Well, very well said. We completely agree that we need to make sure 5G's opportunities reach as many Americans as possible. Yeah. And we'll need some help to do that, so we're completely committed to working with you. Um, but back to the broader 5G issues, um, there's been some discussion about out there about um, approaches like a government-mandated wholesale network, maybe. I hadn't um, heard that. Or Is even that right? nationalization. Really? Oh. Yeah. Um, how, do you, <laughs> how do you view more radical reshaping of our industry? Uh, my position on this is pretty simple, and it has not changed since January 29th of 2018 when I put out a statement to this effect. I oppose any proposal for the government to build, own, or operate a next generation wireless network. I think that history has proven uh, here in the United States with the development of 4G that a market based approach is the best one uh, when, in terms of calibrating uh, investment and innovation in the wireless space. And so going forward, especially as we think that the capital intensity uh, of these new wireless networks is only going to be higher than it was for 4G, we think the best way uh, to, for the government to proceed is to create the building blocks for 5G uh, innovation and then let the private sector take the lead. So that means you're getting the spectrum out there, allowing for infrastructure to be deployed at scale, and then letting the private mar markets uh, take the lead. And Director Kudlow and many others have been very solid on this front as well. And so our hope is that uh, the success that we've had over the last uh, two years uh, will demonstrate, I think, that we are uh, the, the green shoots of, of 5G uh, deployments right now are a proof of concept of our, the wisdom of our market-based approach. And so uh, we're pretty confident that this is the, uh, the best one for America and for American consumers. I hope that with that strong reaffirmation of a vibrant competitive market from both Chairman Pai and the White House today, that we can close the books once and for all on this wrong-headed idea. Um, but let's close. Let's not, close. Not too ambivalent about that. I see. <laughs> no, but just wanted to, wanted to make it wanted to make it clear. Um, so, but let's do. Let's close on um, what five G use case is your or, or industry of the future you want to see the most. For me, it is health monitoring for my dad. Yeah. Or for me personally, it's autonomous commutes. Um, how about you? <laughs> That would be nice, especially since I spent a good hour this morning uh, battling all the folks coming in to see the cherry blossoms. So, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. autonomous commutes at uh, speed would be very nice. But uh, no, there are a whole bunch of them. I mean, last week I was visiting a small farm outside of Sacramento, California, in Yolo County, and I heard from Frank Muller, the owner of uh, Muller Ranch, uh, which is, produces a lot of tomatoes and olives and some of the other things we love to eat, um, how the lack of wireless connectivity is holding back its productivity. And so I think in terms of precision agriculture, that's one of the things I would love to see develop in terms of 5G applications and services. Uh, same thing with education, of course. There are a lot of American school kids who aren't able to have the same educational opportunity, and I think 5G could be a way of solving that problem. Uh, for me personally, though, I will say the one that is, strikes closest to my heart is uh, telemedicine and telehealth. I'm the child of rural physicians, and I remember when I was a kid, my dad driving sometimes 45 minutes west or 45 minutes north just to visit an even smaller town uh, where they, some of the folks there would never see a physician. And I think one of the great things about telemedicine is that at the intersection of broadband and healthcare sits a huge opportunity to make Americans' lives healthier and longer and better. And uh, this issue is constantly brought home to me a few weeks ago I was in Atlanta, uh, where I had the pleasure of uh, meeting uh, one of my childhood heroes, Dominique Wilkins, the NBA star of the, uh, of the Atlanta Hawks. And uh, after I got over my shock and I texted my mom, like, Dominique Wilkins is standing right next to me. Uh, we, we talked about the fact that he's a diabetes patient and he uses uh, wireless devices to monitor his health constantly. And we're working together on ways to extend that promise of telemedicine to disadvantaged populations. Uh, for example, if you're a diabetes patient, it might be prohibitively expensive for you to take time off work, to go into a clinic, to be seen, to get a diagnosis, and then to go back home. But if you had a 5G sensor, essentially a personalized IoT network that could follow you wherever you went, and you could allow your healthcare provider to intervene if your vital signs were going south, that would be a tremendous application. Uh, same thing, I was up in MIT and I met with a woman who, a researcher who had breast cancer, and it occurred to her, well, 
I'm an AI researcher. What if I created an algorithm that could scan thousands of mammograms and detect earlier uh, when women got, were at risk of breast cancer? And so she did that. And as a result of that, she's now created an algorithm that detects, on average, one year before uh, when a woman is likely to get breast cancer. And that's, if you think about 5G with a low latency, with the ability to have edge computing combined with that, I mean, we stand on the brink of some great advances in telemedicine and telehealth. So there, I think it might not be as flashy as some of the 5G applications we hear about, but the bang for the buck is going to be tremendous in terms of, as I said, Americans' lives being longer and better and healthier. Uh, it's true, you know, you're, Mr. Chairman, your job is hard, but you are impacting <laughs> no, everyone's no. life in no. such a powerful way. Um, thank you for joining us. And, and more importantly, thank you for driving our nation's 5G's policies. Let's give them a round of applause. Oh, thank you. Thanks very much. Very kind. Thanks.